Patriots. He's the CEO and co-founder of the newest football league taking over the United States. Charlie Ebersell joins us here on Fox Sports Radio. Hey, Charlie, how you doing? Hey, man, you read it just the way we wrote it. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> I, I will say this. Alliance is a lot easier than AAF. Like, like to, to roll off of just saying the alliance, that just seems to be a lot easier for guys in our... We really is wanted, and that was a big thing for us, is that the reason we have three stars on the logo is it's supposed to be an alliance of the fans, the players, and the game, and that's what we shot to do. That being said, AAF.com is a lot easier to type in than right. alliance.com, so we find a balancing act. Let's start here, because it's the big news of the week. What happened with the players' payments in week one of the alliance? Was was it a missed payment? What happened in where the players ended up being compensated? Explain to us the situation. Yeah, so look, we're a startup, and um, I'm definitely learning a lot of lessons about getting a business to go this big this fast. We went from three employees 13 months ago to 1,300 employees today. Wow. Um, and in that process, one of the things that we realized about eight weeks ago is we needed all of the people that were going to be on the field to be under the same insurance, um, which was going to be different than all of the corporate insurance. And so we made the decision to make the change. And when we made that decision, we underestimated the complexity of the change. And so um, we ended up, uh, when we made the change after the first week, uh, payroll got delayed. It was not a function of whether or not there was cash in the bank. It was a function of the fact that we frankly overestimated our ability to make a pretty seismic change in a boat that was already pretty big. The good news was for us, it happened at the exact same time that Tom Dundon gave us a quarter billion dollars as an investment. And those two things happening at the same time read one way. And and I spent a lot of time on the phone with players. I called Trent Richardson at very early on and said, you know, how's it going? Because he's really got the pulse mm-hmm. of, the, of a lot of, as an older player, et cetera. And he said, man, I got my pay stub on Friday. I got paid a couple of days later, but I knew the money was coming. And so I went to the locker room and said, things are going to be okay. And um, that was huge for us. Um, we're, a, we're a league of opportunity. We're a league of giving players a chance to get back to the NFL. That's our goal. And um, I think that the players have given us a grace period to get our feeding, uh, footing underneath us as we build a league. Um, certainly from our perspective, um, this couldn't... this. It, I like saying it couldn't go better and we couldn't possibly learn more every day than we're learning. Everyone who's ever attempted to do this before us had infrastructure. When my dad and Vince did it with the XFL 17 years ago, General Electric, the biggest company in the world at the time, owned NBC. HR, payroll, insurance, mm-hmm. that stuff was built in. That was a My dad never had a conversation about how you structure a payroll for 1,100 players. Um, I now know more about payroll than I would ever care to know. Um, and we're learning. Ironically, we're moving the entire company or the majority of the company is going over to this system, and um, we've been much more careful about the application of that process. Now. All right, so you don't, the money that was given to you by Dundon invested, you didn't need that to survive? No, well, listen, the short answer is no. The long answer is we're a startup, so we're raising the money in series, right? So we raised a seed when we first started, then we raised a series one, then we raised a series two, so on and so forth. Dundon, after the first week of ratings, what I did not know, I've only learned this over the last couple of days, is that Dundon had actually been looking at our business for more than a year. Um, And he had a lot of mutual friends, a lot of media players that knew a lot about our business. And so he had sort of, uh, he'd said internally, I guess, to people, there's no way I'm investing in this business until I see what happens. Then the ratings happened opening weekend. They were huge. We had a number of different people come to us and offer to invest at at different valuations. And Dundon called me, having just had breakfast with a friend of mine, he called me and said, um, listen, you're going to raise your series B and then your series C, or you could just take series infinity from me. And I said, (laughs) what does that even mean? And he said, how would you like to never raise money again? And I was like, so I signed on the dotted line or is, do you need an initial somewhere? I mean, it was a game changing conversation for two reasons. That's a ton of money, right? Quarter billion dollars. The company's 13 months old. But the second part of it that's even more is he has infrastructure. He has massive companies, a healthcare company, a car company, all of these different things, Top Golf. And so we step in, all of a sudden, CFO, COO, CMO, all these positions that we were pulling together as we were building this company. I mean, look, we jumped out of an airplane uh, while we were sewing the parachute sure. to a large degree. It's a startup. And all of a sudden, uh, he uses the term, we went from being a, let's call it an adolescent business to a mature business with the stroke of one pen. Well, with Steve Spurrier, the head coach of Orlando, and Charlie Ebersall, co-founder of the Alliance of American Football, joining Bill Plasky and myself, Dan Beyer, here on Fox Sports Radio. Spurrier said that an investor backed out and Dundon moved in. Is the, 
Is that correct? Is is, is that? Yeah, there's aspects of the there. So let me start by saying there's certain things that I can say, and there's certain uh-huh. things I can't say. I'm, I have a fiduciary responsibility to my company, and obviously I'm under a, a bunch of confidentiality agreements. Um, one of the challenges that I've had with a company this big is how do you communicate? I'm based in San Francisco. Steve's in Orlando. GMs are all so it's a, there's a, been a lot of communications. One of the things that Dundon has almost immediately shifted for me is, hey, by the way, this is how you communicate to 1,100 employees at the same time. I'm like, oh, that's how you do it. <laughs> um, you know, we've had a number of investors who have wanted to be a part of a football league. You know how this goes. There's Every spring league has had the challenge. We've had investors that have come in and come out and who, who on paper looked like they were legit, where we could call their bank and, oh, they've got a half a billion dollars, and okay, we can see it, et cetera. And then when, a time, when it comes time for the check to actually appear in our bank, um, uh, it, it hasn't happened, and so we've we've moved accordingly. We built the structure, fortunately, around a lot of blue chip investors like Founders Fund and Churn In Group. So we had protections in place so that we weren't going to die. Um, but it it has been um, uh, it's been a challenging experience. Certainly, from I'll tell you quite honestly and candidly, emotionally, I think my mother preferred when I did the show about tracking down terrorists in the Congo for really? two years yeah. with the Navy SEALs. <laughs> then she does this because she calls me and she said, how's it going? And I'm like, oh my God, the guy that was introduced to me by the, you know, Adam Silver or Roger Goodell or whatever that I'm supposed to talk to, he seems great. Oh, he just pulled out. And, you know, what does that mm-hmm. mean? Um, the fortunate part about it is early on, we were able to pull investors in who could backstop that kind of stuff while we found out what our long-term investors are going to be. And I mean, Tom Dundon, it's just... Let me just say it again because it feels so good. A quarter billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. About, yeah. The company's 13 months old. I was A bunch of our investors were the early guys in Facebook. And I said, how long did it take you to get to 300 employees? And they told me. And they said, how long did it take you? And I, I said, 64 days. <laughs> uh, 64 days. I said, how long did it take you to get to $300 million in invested capital? And they told me their answer. They said, how long did it take you? And I was like, uh, less. Less, less. <laughs> Divide your number by three. And <laughs> that's where we're at. So, so what, how can this league, and you've answered this a million times, we see the TV ratings, they've been tremendous. Yeah. It, it, but why, how, what's different about this league? What's going to make this league survive or others have Quality football. Quality football. I'll tell you, uh, well, actually, I'll give you a very, spe- a very specific answer. General managers. Look at, every, look at all the previous leagues. One of the things that Bill pointed out to me early, I missed it. I, I did the documentary about the XFL. I read the book about the USFL. Yeah. I interviewed Mike Tolan and everyone that was around those things at the time. And I didn't notice they never had general managers. And in our case, we have all NFL GMs. So you look at the quality of talent all the way down. It's not a head coach who's also playing the part of a general manager. This is a league in which you have NFL GMs and NFL head coaches that are pulling talent together. The other thing is we're in we're in uh, a deep relationship with the NFL. We have a contract in which there is specifically paperwork that says NFL out. So a player, if he's good enough, Garrett Gilbert, the way he's playing in the league, when someone comes calling him next year to go play in the NFL, we say, you're go with our seven blessings. In fact, you've already signed the document, rock and roll. That's never happened before. We, we have a symbiotic relationship with the NFL as evidenced by the fact we're on the NFL network, as evidenced by the fact that all 32 teams have scouts at all of our games. All 32 teams sent scouts to our preseason. We sent 35 players back to the NFL, including our number one draft pick, Josh Johnson. So make no mistake about it. People were like, when I before we launched, people said, "Whatever you do, there's a dirty word. It starts with a D. Don't say it." And I was like, um, "What?" And they said, "Developmental. Don't say developmental." And I was like, "Don't say it. I'm going to tattoo it across my forehead." What are you talking about? Of course, I want to be developmental. They made forty billion dollars last sure. year. You want to be in the system. You want to make it work. We can build a business that way. Ask the USL, the MLS, AAA baseball. These are multi multi million dollar businesses, and that what made that's what made Dundon different for me is. He really did his research. When he walked in the door, he said, there's a way to do this right, and you're doing it that way. Keep doing that. Stop worrying about all this other nonsense, like fundraising. Charlie Ebersol joining us here on Fox Sports Radio, the CEO and co-founder of the Alliance of American Football on the Doug Gottlieb Show. He's Bill Plaschke. I'm Dan Beyer. You mentioned your dad and, and his role in forming the XFL and saying one of the mistakes was there was no general manager during during that league. What were some of the things that you learned from your dad's experience that didn't work for the XFL that you said, hey, guys, 
this is this is what we have to pay attention to. Few people can talk about it as closely as Bill did because he 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 lived it up close and personal with the <laughs> with the exotic women in hot tubs. He remembers. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I should have a story time on this. Yes, I'll, I'll just yeah. At the XFL, they had women and they had women in hot tubs during the games, and I was convinced in, in the end zones. I was convinced they weren't real fans. Sure enough, I went down and interviewed them. They were strippers who'd been hired to sit in hot tubs oh. <laughs> in the end zone of games. Uh, by the way, Google it. It's one of the best articles. It is hilarious. Which brings us to Robert Kraft. No, no, no. We're, not, no we're not going there. We're not bringing thank, into this. Thank you, guys. I'll see you later. <laughs> um, you know what it is? I'll tell you honestly. Um, quality is the greatest marketer. We spent no money on marketing with the Alliance of American Football. CBS promoted us during NFL games, which got us some attention, but we spent no money on marketing. The XFL spent so much money on marketing that they did tests before the first game. This is a true story. They did audience testing. And a majority of respondents said that defensive players would be allowed to bring folding chairs onto the field to hit <laughs> the offensive players with them. As part of game plan. Uh -huh. So, yeah, marketing was great. Awareness was great. 54 million people tuned in opening weekend, and then nobody tuned in afterwards. At the end of the day, you have to be able to convince agents to convince their clients, the players, that they're going into a system that, A, is going to have quality football, and, B, they're going to have a path back to the NFL. And we have done that. That was not done before. And and also, you can't open up by saying we're the no-fun league and, and the NFL. I mean, the NFL is the no-fun league and we're the well, all that stuff. The documentary was fun, and it's funny, and it was uh, as much about a beautiful relationship between my dad and Vince that you know spanned 40 years. But the big takeaway was um, you don't have to genuflect to the NFL, but you do have to be in a situation where you are symbiotic, where that ecosystem of football is improved by your existence, not hurt. You know what I also think really works for you guys? And I'll just say, when I saw you on the NFL Network, that was a game changer for me. It was. because Because when you see it, it's like, oh, my God, this is – the NFL is behind this. This mm -hmm. is not – net and right there. Also – the only people in the field who don't wear the helmets are the coaches. And your coaches are, are are stars. All of them are stars, and when you see them, I mean, was that part was that part of the plan, or was that a hundred percent, a hundred percent? There were two things that had to happen with the head coaches. One, they had to all have NFL experience. That was a requirement. You cannot tell a player you're going to get him back to the NFL and then have some guy that coached D one football who doesn't know how an NFL locker room works, who doesn't know how uh, to prepare a player for offensive D, uh, NFL offenses and NFL defensive schemes, etc. The other side was we knew they were the, going to be the only credibility factor we had coming out of the gate. So when you asked me, Steve Spurrier said the thing about the investors and was he 70% right or 80% right or whatever, I don't care. I want Steve Spurrier on a microphone, <laughs> on camera, talking about the Alliance of American sure. Football, regardless how he does it. The great moment from opening weekend was him radioing into the player and saying, hey, run the same play, but this time tell him to catch it. Like, <laughs> that's, you know, you kill for that kind of thing. And at the end of the day, if, if, if I learned anything from, by the way, Jerry Jones and Vince McMahon and these other people is don't try to tell people what they have to be. Let them be who they actually are. Honesty sells. And Steve and Mike Mike Singletary, um, he's been incredible. Mike Martz. I couldn't um, take my eyes off Rick Neuheisel. I just watched him because I love watching him on the sidelines. And he's got such credibility. And it's like, oh, my God. I love Rick Neuheisel. Rick Neuheisel, uh, by the way, had, I won't get into it, but he, Spurrier had good quotes about what happened, Rick Neuheisel's were. He called me afterwards, and I was like, "I, I appreciate your support." In this process. <laughs> the Arizona Hotshots is arguably one of the best names in sports. I, I, I say with minor league teams, you always try to come up with like a funny sort of uh, a catchphrase or something that's going to sell mud hats. Devil cat hound. Yeah, yeah, something that's going to sell hats. Like. Arizona Hotshots sells itself. How do you guys come up with names, nicknames, stuff like that with the league? Well, we we. One of the things that's really important around a, the name of a team is how it interacts with the community. And obviously the RNL 19, the, the firefighters, the biggest loss of firefighters in uh, since 9-11, um, was one thing that we knew about the community that was important. But the bigger story, my father-in-law is a, a former firefighter and a former police officer. And first responders are something we talk about a lot, but you rarely see. You don't see police and firefighters represented. And the hot shots represent the Navy SEALs of the firefighters. You know, you have structural firefighters and you've got these guys going for us. And then the double entendre of hot shots yeah. um, was extraordinary. And the thing was, we looked to the community to say, is this acceptable? Is this something you want to be a part of? We're honoring you. We want to be a part of it. And it's been it's been remarkable. The San Diego Fleet, the San Antonio Commanders. M one of my favorite when, it, when we figured it out was the Orlando Apollos. Because one, it's the Sunshine State and Apollo is the god of the sun. But also... It's part of the Space Coast where the Apollo missions oh, sure. launched. Yeah, yeah. So we actually had an Apollo astronaut bring out the first ball at the first game. 
And they've taken on this pose when they score touchdowns of firing Apollo Zero, and they call themselves the gods, which we'll <laughs> see how that plays out. But ultimately, that stuff really matters, and I think it's been uh, it's been well-received, which is cool. Well, speaking of a hot shot, what about Colin Kaepernick? We heard all the reports that he wanted $20 million to play for you guys. Had had you ever been in contact with him? Are you in contact with him? Could he ever play quarterback? I mean, how does where do you all stand with him? I, Colin and I had a number of different conversations. We sat down a bunch of times. We had long conversations. I respect Colin as not only as a player, but as somebody that, look, if you agree with him or you don't agree with him, you can't question his conviction. I mean, he, he was willing to risk everything for, for his belief. And, and I, look, what I said to him, which is what I've said to everyone, uh, is we are a league of opportunity. We are a league to get you back to the NFL. If you want and or need a path back to the NFL, we're the right place to play. And if you want to play within our system, we play all the we pay all the players the same amount of money. We we give a bonusing structure, which you sell a lot of jerseys, you make a lot of money in our league. Like that's how we that's how we built it up. But this is really meant for everybody to be playing into the same system, and uh, we we gave that opportunity. And each player has to make that decision for themselves. For Trent Richardson, he saw this as a way to re re reposition his story and and show who he was. And for other players, you know, they wanted to to go a different route. And I respect them either way. One of the things we've tried to be is a league for players. Um, and I think we've begun to succeed at that. Troy Polamalu has done a phenomenal job running our players' relation group and building out, you know, the most advanced healthcare in the history of professional sports and all the other sides of it. So, do you actively seek out players, or do they come to you? What's both? I okay. mean, look, it's at, we're scouting. I mean, make no mistake sure. about it. Um, uh, Russ Gilio and, and and Joey Roberts, um, and then Tony Softly and, and Bill Kuharik, they've done an extraordinary job. Look, we signed over 794 players to contracts, and that came down to 415, but. To have almost 800 players under contracts, unheard of. And the fact that 81% of our players had played in or signed an NFL contract is extraordinary. Although I still think the most impressive number is 78% of all of our players graduated four years of college. Wow. Well, all right. So what about, so the the TV ratings have been spectacular. They even beat uh, Houston OKC the first weekend in NBA, which is amazing to me. What about the attendance? We see... Pictures in men in uh, in Arizona, I think in Memphis and Birmingham, the attendance has not has been inconsistent and spotty. What how does how does that change? What happens with that? Well, I mean, in full disclosure, attendance is uh, a bit above where we actually thought it was going to be coming out of the gate. Look, we we took an organic approach to this. We didn't spend thirty million in marketing because one, the thing I said about folding chairs, mm-hmm. but the other thing was. I've always been a believer in under promise and over deliver. My my investors and now including Tom Dundon really understood that this was a long term play. Tom is actually a lot more patient than I am. He really believes in if you build it organically, they will come. If you try to shove it down their throat, they will not. And if you give away free tickets, they really won't. They'll they'll never become long term wow. aficionados of of what you're building or fans of what you're building. So you look at San Antonio where we're, we did 27,000 the first game, we did 30, 29,174 the second one, or you look at Orlando where we had twenty five or 26,000 people in the stadium. Um, you look at the fact that in Birmingham and Memphis, those two games, the average temperature was 38 degrees and it was raining during both games, right. and the fact that it's a new league. But at the same time, can we get better? The list of things that I would like to improve on is about 15 pages long, single-spaced, and size 8 font. So trust me, we want to do that infusing a quarter billion dollars into the business so that we can have a long-term view and be more patient around that kind of stuff obviously makes us very happy. Did I say quarter billion? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have I mentioned Tom Dundon yeah. shifted yeah. the entire yeah. dynamic of the business? A lot of zeros. We're going to let you get to that 15-page list. We appreciate the time. Charlie Ebersol, CEO and co-founder of the Alliance of American Football. 